All right, hello everybody. Welcome back to the British Blockchain Association ISC 2020. Uh, you've got myself and Emmanuel for 20 minutes. Very excited to be here. Hope you're all safe and well wherever you are in the world. Great to see such a, a great collection of uh, people in the session from all around the world, uh, from Asia all the way to the Americas. So brilliant coverage. Great to see you all here. I've got 10 minutes and I'm going to talk to you briefly about the concept of using blockchain for health certification and digital health uh, credentials. I've been working for the past 12 months. I'm a partner in IBM, uh, focusing on a proposition that we call IBM Digital Health Pass. We've been working with governments, with the private sector, looking at the safe return to work, travel and entertainment. And 10 minutes is a very short period of time to be able to cover all of this particular topic. So I want to try and give you a couple of concepts talk briefly about uh, things to think about and why blockchain makes sense, uh, or why blo we think blockchain is a, uh, a part of the technology stack that makes sense in this particular context, and show a little bit about what we've been up to. So I'm gonna share screen just for a second and see if we can bring up the PowerPoint. All right, someone tell me whether they can see what I'm sharing. So broadly speaking, I think within the last 12 months, we're all relatively familiar with the concept of health credentials, health certification, or what some people are calling digital passports, digital health passports. And most ca most cases, people associate it with applications, with an app, something you hold on your smartphone. Uh, and even further than that, most people assume that it's relating to the use of a QR code to be able to verify face-to-face -to -face with another device um, that a credential is linked to an individual. And I think what I'd like to share is over the last sort of 12 months has been a huge amount of speculation, a huge amount of concern, a huge amount of uh, you know, appropriate challenging around how do we think about the policy considerations of this? How do we think about the privacy considerations of this? How does this fit into existing digital experiences? How does this fit into uh, existing journeys, whether you be a passenger getting onto an airplane or a boat or a cruise, whether you're an employee returning to work, whether you want to go to a sports venue, a theater, whatever it might be, there are different considerations in each of those. And regardless, in all cases, policy becomes a critical consideration. The input of, um, medical advisors, you know, medical authorities is also critical. Uh, but also at the same time, the technology has a number of different ways in which it can be implemented. And from our experience, it differs every single time. Um, so in the last few weeks, you will have noticed or hopefully noticed uh, announcements that IBM are supporting the likes of uh, the German government. Um, we're doing work in Denmark. In For New York State in the US, we're working with a number of the large uh, vaccine and pharma manufacturers like Moderna. And we're also engaged in a number of the standards bodies, WHO, uh, the Good Health Pass Initiative, to look at how can we use blockchain and other technologies to look at interoperability between credentials platforms. What we can see over the next uh, six months, 12 months, you know, as soon as the summer, we're going to see a number of different um, health credentials platforms that are going to need to talk to each other. Imagine you're an employer or an airline and you're getting passengers from a number of different jurisdictions all coming in, holding different credentials, holding different passports, some issued by national and state governments, some issued by um, private sector organizations or testing companies themselves. How does this all fit together? Uh, and so the platform, the integration, the standards bit that sits underneath all of these credentials is the critical part. As you all know, there are three components to a solution that relates to verifiable credentials. You've got the holder, the citizen themselves. You've got the issuer in terms of the healthcare organization, the testing provider, the government, whoever it might be that is issuing uh, COVID test results, that's issuing uh, vaccine res results, vaccine certificates. And then you've got the verifier. Those could be companies, schools, universities, travel, a number of different settings in which a verifier might look to verify that you have an up-to-date credential. An important thing to consider and, and something that I think most people miss here is that the relationship between the holder and the issuer already exists. If you're already going to be tested or if you're already going to be vaccinated, in 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, you will be giving your consent for that organization to test you. You'll be giving your consent for them to give you a vaccination and a record will be created as a result. And what we're looking to do with IBM Digital Health Pass and a number of similar architectures that are out there is to issue credentials that a network can verify, not to create PII or consent models that don't exist already today, to be able to orchestrate those credentials between the issuer and verifier, and to do that in a trust in the tamper proof in an anonymized and in a, in a, a obfuscated way, such that you as a holder, you as a citizen, have complete control over who you share that information with. 
um, that the consent model and the data model between you and the issuer hasn't changed. And all we're really doing is giving the individual back their data in the form of a credential that can be verified uh, with their control. And so this is a critical part of it, is that we're not adding any PII that doesn't already exist. We're not changing the relationship between you and the issuer, but we're making it easier for the verifier to trust the information or the data that's that's being received in the form of a digital credential. Uh, because from an operational perspective, in a number of ways that's being managed with paper, uh, with PDF documents, with physical and digital processes today, that's at the moment already challenging with reduced um, passenger loads going through airports uh, with a smaller number of staff working on physical locations. But as we scale that up, and the one thing that the, that the pandemic has given us is a need to manage or to verify health status at a global level uh, to number number of uh, transactions or to a quantum that has never ever been required at this scale at this stage uh, in our development. So from a digital transformation perspective, that's hugely challenging. I don't want to go too much into the detail of how it works because in most cases it's different. You know, you'll understand that you will have an, an app or it might be a portal. You might have something that's printed and carried with you. The verification approach can be a mobile one, you know, via an application, it can be embedded into a digital experience, it can be embedded into a check-in process, it could even be linked to entry and access management in a workplace. There are a number of different ways in which credentials can be surfaced and validated. It doesn't always have to involve a QR code. Uh, so then critically, the importance of the platform that sits underneath and how we manage that is really, really important. As I said at the beginning of the show, what we're going to see over the next few weeks and months is a number of different solutions coming out. A number of the private sector ones already having been tested or being trialed in a number of different industry settings. You're going to see industry specific solutions, uh, industry organizations starting to develop their own proprietary solutions as well because they want to get their sector uh, or their particular industry back to economic recovery. And you're going to see a number of different uh, national and state government solutions, some blockchain based, some not, some centralized, some not, some with more open architecture, some not. And again, the critical drip feeding of standards that come through from uh, the WHO, from uh, specific industry authorities, from regional government, from national government, the technical data, the payload data, uh, and some of, some of the maybe even interoperability patterns uh, that might be out there. From our perspective as IBM Digital Health Pass, we started with those that were already established and out there, um, W3C verifiable credentials, some of the data standards specific to healthcare, uh, FHIR, for example, JSON, a number of the basics that are the most mature standards that we know to be out there at this point in time, because frankly, those working in blockchain health credentials have been doing this for a number of years. Uh, it's not that we started at the beginning of the pandemic, it's more that the requirement for this capability scaled very quickly. So. There's a lot to cover. I realize that in, in nine minutes plus the one for any Q&A or anybody who add, added anything in the chat, um, this is a particularly um, broad topic. There's an awful lot to it. It is particularly complex and it is very emotive. What I would say is take time to understand the architecture, take time to understand the landscape, take time to ask appropriate questions of what the role of technology versus policy is uh, and, and challenge appropriately. This is going to be an important domain over the next a uh, few months and years. Uh, and from an IBM perspective, it's something that we're spending a significant amount of time globally with private and public sector trying to unpick. Uh, it's not simple, uh, but there are a lot of people in a number of different sectors trying as hard as they possibly can to support the economic recovery. And we believe that digital health credentials is going to be a part of that. There are a number of other different components of that too. Uh, and in all cases, we need to ensure that we look at uh, accessibility, that we've got the less digitally enabled journeys covered, that we think at the, the all of the unhappy paths and edge cases to be able to enable this. It's not that any one pass or any one QR code is going to unlock the rest of the world. This is going to be a challenging um, initiative for a significant period of time. That having been said, it does highlight some of the fundamentals that sit underneath all blockchain projects standardization, digitization, and collaboration. And this is a great microcosm or a great case study for anybody to look at. I think I'm over time or I think I'm just about at time. So I don't know if there are any particular questions or if there are any in the chat that anyone can surface, but um, thank you very much for taking the time. Please feel free to reach out. Anything um, that you want to hear more about this, very happy for you guys to connect with me on LinkedIn or to um, reach out. And uh, thank you very much for the time. Emmanuel, I'll hand over to you. 
Thank you very much, Anthony, and uh, thank you for, for a great presentation. I think there were some questions in the in the Q and A's in the chat, so I guess the organizers would probably uh, send us the questions afterwards. I know we're a bit uh, pressed by time, and you have to go. So thanks a lot, uh, and uh, thank you to the British Blockchain Association for the invitation to uh, to speak at uh, at this event. Uh, very pleased to be here, and let me try to share my screen. Uh, I hope that the magic will operate. Um, let's see whether. Oh. Let's see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, brilliant. So, uh, we don't see it. Let me try to, if I put it like this. Oh, no, I can't. Okay. I'm sorry for that. Okay. So, let's, let's do it like this. Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I've been asked to give you an overview of the latest findings of the study that I conducted with uh, Deepesh Patel of Trade Finance Global on the trade blockchain ecosystem. Uh, I've been trying to follow developments in that sphere for the past few years. Uh, things are changing extremely rapidly. And so we thought it would be useful to get a sense of what are the different initiatives that, um, that have emerged. Uh, where do they stand? What is the stage of, of maturity? We all know that uh, trade is very uh, labor and paper intensive. And it's quite a pack to some extent. There are 4 billion documents generated as a result of trade activities. And you can see here on the screen the different interactions uh, between the different players, um, complex web of interactions that create a lot of inefficiencies. And so, of course, blockchain opens interesting opportunities and has been um, investigated by a number of actors in the field to try and see how these frictions could be removed from international trade, um, how it can bring transparency, traceability, trust, there are a number of different actors involved in international trade and the, uh, the ability to interact on a peer-to-peer -peer basis in a highly trusted environment is something that is very much valued. So we've been trying to map uh, with Deepesh the different um, projects in the trade and trade finance space. But we also conducted uh, a survey of those in that space to get a better sense of what they see as the key benefits of uh, distributed ledger technology when it comes to trade and international trade. And not surprisingly, uh, the top three uh, benefits that were mentioned were uh, transparency um, in, in terms of transactions, uh, gains in speed and uh, efficiency, and real-time overview uh, of transactions. Uh, so this is what you can see here on the screen. As I said, we've been uh, trying to map the different uh, projects out there. Um, and as you can see here, this is the latest um, periodic table that we published last year. We published a previous one in 2019, and I will talk about the evolution between uh, the two in a, in a moment. But you can see that there's a wealth of projects out there. A number of them in, in pink, in um, red, sorry, are related to digitalization of trade documents and trade transactions. You also have quite a few in blue related to trade finance. And trade finance is, has actually been one of the most uh, compelling use cases when it comes to, uh, to blockchain, with several projects that are quite mature, like uh, Congo or, or Without Trade, for example. Quite a few projects as well in green here on the uh, periodic table uh, that relate to uh, shipping and logistics. And then we see a number of projects that are more a mix um, or hybrid projects that are uh, marketplaces, for example, or that mix different features of, of the other projects. But so what we've seen is a great increase in the number of projects between 2019 and 2020, from 29 in uh, 2019 to 44 last year. And we've also been uh, looking at the uh, average maturity of these different projects. And what we've seen is a steady progress towards trade digitalization. In 2019, the average stage of maturity of these projects stood at 2.3 on a scale of uh, five, with one being proof of concept stage and five being fully mature, fully operational. And in 2020, uh, so the, the last publication, the average stage had increased to 3.3 um, on, on average. But what we're seeing is that uh, in spite of all the uh, new projects uh, that have emerged in trade finance, transportation logistics, uh, digitalization of trade documents like bills of lading, for example, customs development or trading. 
Uh, many projects out there are still at the level of proof of concept or pilot stage. The most advanced project is Kadena in Latin America uh, that looks at authorized economic operators and mutual recognition of authorized economic operators. But otherwise, not much has been happening. There are a few projects in, in Asia uh, that are maturing, but they're still at pilot stage. Interestingly, things seem to be uh, evolving. Um, a number of customs authorities do participate in projects like Trade Lens, for example. Um, so they, they participate in projects developed by others. But the fact that these customs developments are trailing is somewhat a bit boring when you think about international trade, because an international trade transaction touches upon a number of ledgers and customs is, of course, a, a critical component. So I'm actually um, working with the uh, WCO, the World Customs Organization, to try and dig a bit deeper into that and see uh, what are the key challenges that customs authorities are um, are facing and uh, why customs development are trailing. So that will be the next uh, the next research. But so when we're doing this uh, mapping, we also ask the different players out there what were the key challenges. Interestingly, um, if we ask them about the different types of challenges in an open way, uh, you can see here that technical challenges are actually very uh, low compared to some other challenges. The first, the, the top challenge that actors in the field in trade and trade finance are facing when it comes to um, implementation of DLT are legal challenges, followed by lack of standards, and it's not surprising, and actually Anthony touched upon that uh, in his presentation, and then governance issues, which is also a critical aspect. And this is quite interesting because uh, legal issues are very often overlooked uh, or they, they are not uh, the subject of as much focus as the technical aspects of um, interoperability. Well, they are critical. And this is the message that I've been trying to convey uh, in the context of my work at the World Customs Organization. Uh, the legal regulatory interoperability is critical because you can have great digital technology, but if your legislation does not require e-signatures and e-documents, you won't go very far. Likewise, implementing the um, UNC trial model law on electronic transferable records is critical. There's some critical work to be done on the issue of uh, the liability framework, legal clarity, certainty, privacy. So yes, the technical aspects of interoperability are, are critical, and there's a lot of work being done um, at, uh, on the technical aspects of the platform level, but also on the question of data standardization. Uh, but the legal aspects are also of the utmost importance um, and uh, due regard should be given to those aspects. What we've also done in the latest publication was to try and map the different uh, standardization or key standardization initiatives that um, relate to trade specifically and or that matter for uh, international trade. So you have some international standards bodies like ISO ITU that have put in place uh, some working groups, but you also have a number of private sector um, initiatives like MOBI, BETA, the DCSA that are developing standards. And the DCSA, for example, um, the Digital Container Shipping Association, actually issued a standard earlier this year on the e-bill of lading. And so there are some discussions now in the context of the more general trade uh, initiatives, in particular the ICCDSI, the Digital Standards Initiative that was launched in September uh, last year, to try and see how we can connect all these dots, because we see that there's a lot of work being done on this issue of standardization. Uh, but for the moment, there is nothing that allows us to connect all these dots to truly digitalize trade end to end. Because if we want to digitalize trade end to end, we really need to work on all the different aspects um, of uh, trade digitalization, all the aspects from trade finance to customs. But we also need to make sure that we develop standards that are applicable end to end. So the WTO is now involved in the ICC Digital Standards Initiative to try and uh, connect these different dots uh, and try to, um, to, to allow for end-to-end -end, uh, digitalization of international trade. So what comes out of uh, these studies is that, yes, there is a very significant potential of um, blockchain to digitalize international trade and to remove the inefficiencies, but there's really a, a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of a greater interoperability, in particular when it comes to uh, the, the regulatory aspects that are often uh, overlooked. Hence the need to uh, connect the dots, 
or work together all the stakeholders at an international level uh, to to avoid um, these uh, these issues. And uh, just to uh, close, because I've already spoken 10 minutes, you can find here a few resources on uh, the issue of blockchain and international trade, um, including the, the, the mapping that I just uh, mentioned. Uh, so if you want to know more, uh, please do not hesitate to have a look at these publications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, excellent presentation. And thank you, Anthony. Um, we will quickly move on to the next uh, session. Um, there are a couple of questions which uh, we'll email to the um, to speakers uh, and hopefully they can answer. So uh, let's move on to the next session. I'm going to end this session here. So everyone Thank go you. to the lounge and then we will we'll start, the, start the next one. Thank you.